Hi guys, it's Lauren. Welcome to welcome back to my channel. In this video, I am going to be reading you guys a story from Reddit No Sleep. So, without further ado, let's get into the video. So, this story is actually part of a series, so if you guys would like to hear the rest of it, let me know in the comments down below and I will make another part. It's called, I found a set of blank cassette tapes at the junk store and I can't believe what was on them. Growing up as a young kid in the late 1980s, I was always terrified by the stories I'd hear of people who go to the grocery store, take a hike in the woods, or even a trip to a crowded beach and would disappear, never to be seen again. Whenever I'd see their faces memorialized on the back of milk cartons, their last photographs forever immortalized in the macabre medium of ink on cardboard, it would send shivers down my spine. But the truth is, by the mid-1990s, I had overcome my fears, too preoccupied by the distractions of an adolescent life. That is, until one day, in 1996, when, at the age of 14, a mere freshman in high school during my weekly pilgrimage to the junk store, I made a discovery in the cassette pile that would change my life forever. You're still listening to tapes? My best friend Jess asked, rolling her eyes, a nerd in the truest sense. Get with it, dude. CDs are the future. Higher dynamic range, superior sound quality, it's not even a question. Yeah, yeah, I replied, ignoring her criticism as I rummaged through the store's now mound of cassettes, its collection having significantly accumulated since the dawn of the compact disc just a few years prior. Look at that thing. It just looks not cool, my friend Mike added as he pointed to my cassette player, which was clipped onto my belt, its black plastic headphones draped around my neck. I swear, if you wear that to school and the football team asks, I'm denying that we're friends. Somewhere between elementary school and high school, he'd been converted to an athlete and by association became popular, but I didn't care about being cool, or acting cool, or dressing cool. I just liked what I liked, and to me, cassettes were functional and cheap, and that, to me, was really cool. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never, I began to say to them, before something caught my eye at the bottom of the box. It was a stack of eight homemade cassette tapes, each with a number scribbled onto it, bundled together by a flimsy old rubber band that looked like it would break at any moment. There was just something about them, something so nondescript, so unapologetic, so mysterious, that I felt compelled to buy them without even knowing what was recorded onto their magnetic tape. What are you guys doing later? I asked Jess and Mike as we left the store and began our walk home. The ocean's waves showering us with mist as they crashed along the seawall of our small south shore town. First game of the season tonight, Mike replied. Wouldn't miss it. You should check it out. Even I'm watching, Jess added. We signed Walker in the draft. I just have a feeling about this season. No thanks, I declined. I just can't get into sports, despite my blue-collar dad's continued attempts to convert me. Your loss, Mike replied as we parted ways, each of us heading off in different directions. Later that night, I was lying in bed, fantasizing about a world where Jess confessed her undying love for me when I suddenly remembered that I'd bought the cassette tapes earlier that day. So, I found the one labeled one, popped it into my cassette player, and hit the rewind button. After a minute, I heard it stop and pressed play. Click. Expecting to hear some grunge, Britpop, or maybe even ska music. What came out of the speakers was something else. If you're listening to this, a man said, his ominous voice crackling over the magnetic tape. You found my instructions on where to find the bodies in the marsh. What the heck? I thought to myself, nearly spitting out my soda. This must be some kind of prank. But for some reason, I couldn't stop listening. Bodies that, if discovered in the correct order, will provide clues to who I am and why I did what I did. Okay, maybe it's some sort of audio game? Like a detective thing. Yes, that must be it. As this is the first cassette in the set of eight, for this tape I'll be providing step-by-step -step instructions on how to find the first body. So, when you're ready, please proceed to the marshes on 139 where the bend of the road meets the sharp turn sign. You'll want to pause the tape now until you get there. Click. I did just as he instructed and paused the tape. 139. That's an actual street, not far away. Wait a minute, could this be real? I wasted no time. Picking up the plastic rotary telephone that I'd begged my parents to let me keep in my room and called Jess's house. What the heck, dude? She answered. You just booted me offline. I've been downloading this song all day and it was at 95%. Sorry, I replied, but there's something I need to tell you. I proceeded to tell her about the tape 
and its instructions and asked her to skip school with me the next day to accompany me on my search for the bodies. Naturally, she laughed off the request, citing a presentation she had to give at school the next day, but offered up going right then and there. At night? Are you crazy? I asked. I mean, it's not real, so what's the worst that could happen? She reasoned. Okay, let's call Mike. I would have bet a million dollars that Mike would have declined the invite and called me an idiot for even entertaining the idea. But when he picked up the phone, he was so upset that the boys in green, as he called them, had lost that he jumped at the chance to get out of the house. Really? I replied. Yeah, I can't listen to my old man make up excuses for them anymore. It's much too early in the season. About an hour later, Jess, Mike, and I met at the marshes on 139 where the bend of the road meets the sharp turn sign, just as the narrator, as I'll call him, had described. Where to now, genius? Mike asked, gesturing to the immense stretch of marshland that lay before us. A stretch of marshland that was so expansive, in fact, that our town was even named for it. One second, I said before putting on my headphones and pressing play on the cassette player. Click. If you're listening now, it means you made it to the starting point. Next, you'll want to turn to the marsh and scan the horizon for an old scarecrow. Once you find it, walk across the top of the marsh, careful not to fall into its trenches until you reach the scarecrow. Until then, pause the tape. Once again, I did just as he instructed and paused the tape before returning my headphones to my neck and looking off into the distance. Sure enough, about a football field's distance away was the scarecrow, its body illuminated by the moonlight, its arms open wide as if calling us over to join it. Follow me, I said to my friends. A few minutes later, I was trudging through the grassy surface of the marshlands, my flashlight in hand as Jess and Mike lagged behind me, bantering away as usual. It's up, up, down, down, right, left, right, left, A, B, and start, Mike said. No, you idiot. It's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, and start, Jess corrected. Will you two shut up already? I called out as I forged ahead, too annoyed to look back at him. You know what, Tyler? I'm really starting to worry about you, dude, Mike said. Oh yeah? Why is that? I replied, rolling my eyes. You're really changing. Hanging out at the comic book store, listening to metal, and worst of all, wearing those flannels around your waist. I stopped in my tracks and turned back to him. Me change? Dude, I saw you bullying Shay in the locker room with the other football players. So what? The kid deserved it. Did he? Why? For being a nerd. That's why. And you know what? What? Maybe you deserve to be bullied too. I dropped my flashlight and stormed over to him before we both locked eyes, fists clenched. That's when we heard Jess call back to us from up ahead. Hey guys, she said. We both looked over to her. Jess simply pointed a few feet away where we saw a giant scarecrow towering above the marsh, its wooden body barely keeping it standing, nearly all of its hay having fallen off. Click. If you're listening now, it means you made it to the scarecrow. Next, you'll want to look out at the Y-shaped ravine before you, separating you from two different patches of marsh. Jump to the one on the left, take about five steps, and dig there. That's where you'll find the first body and a clue. After you find it, you'll want to switch to the second tape. Click. I relayed the recording to my friends who had very different reactions. I'm not jumping, Jess said. Stand back, Mike interrupted as he took a few steps back, crouched down, ran, and cleared the ravine, his boots splashing into the muddy marsh on the other side. Jess and I simply looked at each other, then over at Mike, then down at the ravine, and finally back at each other. A few minutes later, Jess was helping me up from the ravine, she too, having just crawled up from it after falling in. Meanwhile, Mike was laughing so hard at us that he stumbled backwards and tripped over something. Seeing that Mike too was now covered in mud, Jess and I joined in on the laughter, and before we knew it, all three of us were all uncontrollably howling under the moonlight. All three of us dirt caked onto all of our clothes. But then Mike stopped laughing. Hey guys, he said. Jess and I looked over at him. What the heck is that? He continued pointing at an object that was protruding from the marsh. I turned on my flashlight, shined it onto the object, and was shocked to find a human hand, long decomposed, its digits collapsed into the mud, its wrist bones sticking up through the grass. Jess screamed at the top of her lungs. Mike, having just stood up, fell back to the ground, his eyes wide in horror. I took it the worst of all, immediately turning to the ravine and gagging into it, as if that was the polite place to do it. But wait, Jess began. That means... They're real. The tapes are real, and there are seven more bodies out here, I muttered, my body beginning to tremble. Cool, Jess said before taking a closer look. We've got to tell someone. The cops. Let's get out of here, I said, still in shock. Are you kidding, dude? We have a once-in-a-lifetime chance here to find these bodies. Now let's find the clue and play the other tape, Mike said, his voice excited but his body shaking. He does have a point, as disgusting as it is, Jess added. 
You can't be serious, I yelled out to them both. Hey, you're the one that found the tapes and wanted to come out here, Jess replied. The way I see it, there's only one way to decide, Mike called out. Oh yeah? What's that? I asked. We vote, he said with a smile. A few minutes later, Mike and Jess were digging through the mud, searching for the clue, as I watched on in horror, switched tape one for tape two, and pressed play. Click. So that is the end of part one. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you disliked it, give it a thumbs down. I don't really care. Subscribe if you're new. Comment down below videos you would like to see next. Let me know what you guys thought on this story so far. I'm curious to see what the remaining cassette tapes say and where they find the other bodies and what they end up doing about it. And I'm curious to see if the serial killer is found in the end. So I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!